Well, this is a particularly fulfilling introduction for me. Our next speaker is someone whose life work, advocacy, and activism, informed by a deeply compassionate mind and wide-ranging inquisitive heart, explore the deepest psychosocial factors in our society's unsustainability. Gabor Mate is one of those rare, penetrating thinkers who expose many of our society's most profound contradictions. But he has far more to offer us than just intellectual brilliance, for his vision is one of profound caring. This is a man who seeks not just to understand, but also to help us heal some of our rawest, most intractable social wounds. Common to all of Gabor's work is a holistic approach to understanding the broader social, cultural, and spiritual context in which human disease and disorders arise. A Hungarian-born Canadian physicist who survived the Nazi genocide as an infant, Dr. Mate has won wide acclaim as a specialist in treating addiction and for his unique perspectives on attention deficit disorder. His internationally best-selling books include In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts, Close, Close Encounters with Addiction, When the Body Says No, The Cost of Hidden Stress, and Scattered Minds, A New Look at the Origins and Healing of Attention Deficit Disorder. Based in Vancouver, he has long worked with patients suffering from mental illness, drug addiction, and HIV, or all three, and has been a major advocate of harm reduction and a sharp critic on the war on drugs. One of the major themes of his work has been the crucial impact of childhood experiences on our mental and physical health and the critical need for nurturing adults in children's lives to guarantee healthy brain development. He makes a very strong case that the stresses modern social structures and inequities place on families and the absence of non-stressed parenting are proving highly destructive to children's well-being and to the future of our society. He is also a passionate advocate for a form of medicine that honors the totality of our human beingness, the entire mind-body-spirit continuum. Please join me in welcoming one of the most incisive diagnosticians of our society's deep diseases and a man who is a visionary healer whose insight, clarity, candor, and compassion may offer some of our best medicines, Dr. Gabor Mate. Thank you very much for that very generous introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here. I hate to tell you, though, I'm not a physicist. I'm a physician. I'm not that smart. <laughs> well, it's a pleasure to address this audience here and those of you that are watching elsewhere and those of you that may be watching this some years from now, who knows, on the Internet. I wish I could tell you that a few years from now, what I have to say will no longer be timely, but I'm not that optimistic. When we look around this society and from the perspective of health, what do we see? We see that 50% of adults in this society, which considers itself the most successful society in the history of the world, actually suffers of some chronic illness, heart disease, high blood pressure, uh, cancer, whatever, autoimmune disease, whatever it happens to be. 50% of adolescents today are now set to meet the diagnostic criteria for one or another mental health condition. There are three, million, three and a half million children in this country who are receiving stimulant medications for ADHD. And in my own country, Canada, the number of prescriptions for ADHD has gone up 43% in the last five years. There, there are um, half a million children in this country who are receiving antipsychotic medications. Not because they have psychosis, but because they are upset and their behaviors are problematic. What we have here is the massive experiment in the chemical control of children's brains without knowing what actually the long-term effects will be. I know that in Vancouver, British Columbia, where I live and work, 
there's a clinic at the Children's Hospital specifically to deal with the side effects of antipsychotic medications on children. In the United States, the antipsychotics, Risperdal and Seroquel, I think are in the top four or six, four to six uh, prescriptions given out in this country, not to mention the antidepressants. Now, how do we understand all this in this very successful society? Well, medicine, mainstream medical perspective in which I was trained, basically uh, looks at it from a very strictly physical point of view. Mainstream medicine separates two areas that can't be separated. One is separates mind from the body. So we treat the body as a discrete entity without reference to people's emotional and spiritual lives, number one. And number two, we separate the individual from the environment as if the individual was not affected by the environment. Now, I'll give you three examples of how that's simply not applicable. It's been studied now and well documented that children whose parents are stressed are more likely to have asthma. So in polluted areas where the air pollution itself acts as an irritant and therefore uh, increases the risk of asthma, which represents an irritability of the airways, it's the children of parents who are most stressed who are most likely to have asthma. In other words, the psychological emotional states of the child, of the parent, I should say, affects the physiology of the child's lungs. And how do we treat asthma? Guess what? We treat them with stress hormones, adrenaline and cortisol. But we never ask ourselves, does stress have something to do with causing these kids asthma? In Australia, to give you another example of what I mean by the biopsychosocial nature of human beings, which is to say that our biology is shaped and affected, influenced for a lifetime by our psychological and social in relationships and environment. In Australia, they looked at 500 women or so with breast biopsies for suspicious lumps. Now, before the results came back, these women underwent a psychological interview. It turned out that if a woman had been emotionally stressed prior to the onset of that lump, that by itself did not increase the chance of that lump being cancerous. Zero effect. Similarly, if a woman was emotionally isolated, that had no effect either. Zero. But if a woman was emotionally isolated and stressed, the risk of that lump being cancerous was nine times as great as the average. Now, the physicians couldn't figure this one out, because logically speaking, how does zero and zero add up to nine? How does zero and zero multiply to nine? But if we understand that human beings' physiology is affected by their relationships, then we see that when stress happens, cortisol elevates in the body, which is a stress hormone, which suppresses the immune system. Adrenaline increases in the body, which uh, disorganizes the nervous system. In the short term, they help you fight back or to escape, but in the long term, they actually can suppress the body. No wonder then that people are isolated and stressed are more likely to develop disease, which is to say that the disease is not simply a manifestation of some physical process unique to them, but it reflects their particular lives in a particular environment, in a particular culture. And finally, at the end of life, a study in the New England Journal of Medicine some years ago showed that a couple who've been together for a long time, when one of them is hospitalized, the other one has a significantly increased risk of dying. Which is to say that the physiology of us human beings is very much affected by the environment. And that is what may be called, and I refer to as a biopsychosocial perspective. We think that may be new. Well, it's revolutionary as far as mainstream medicine is concerned, but it's certainly not new. The Buddha said 2,500 years ago, he talked about the interconnection of everything, the, what he called the interconnected core arising, interdependent core arising of phenomena. So he said, look at a raindrop. It doesn't just contain uh, itself. You can't just understand it as an isolated entity. In fact, it contains um, the, the, the sky. Look at a leaf. It contains the sky in terms of the irrigation. It contains the earth in terms of the materials that go into it and the sun in terms of the light that's needed to make it grow. And he said that the birth and death of any phenomena are connected to the birth and death of all other phenomena. The one contains the many, and the many contains the one. Without the one, there cannot be the many. Without the many, there cannot be the one. And that was said 2,500 years ago, a lesson we're still trying to integrate and to understand and to apply to our lives. Now, I know that at a conference such as Bioneers, the emphasis is very much on the physical environment, particularly what we're doing to nature. And that's valid and necessary. 
but I think we need to broaden our view to the, of the environment to actually include also the social, relational, interactive, and cultural aspects as well. Now to, uh, and, also, and also the economic ones. So for example, a study a little while ago showed that uh, when women who are pregnant breathe in polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, their children are more likely to have uh, behavior problems by school age. So we think this is simply a physically environmental problem. No, it isn't. It's also a socioeconomic one, since it's poor women who tend to live in more polluted areas. And therefore, the medical scientists who did the study at Mount Sinai University um, School, School of Medicine, Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York said, this is really a paper about social justice. Poor people have more exposure to these things on all accounts, whether bad air or psychosocial social stress and other things. That's a societal problem, and the changes are not going to be on an individual level. They're going to be on a societal level. You can't separate individuals from their environment. Or to take another example, we know that lead exposure actually um, disturbs the nervous system, leading to learning and behavior problems. But amongst poorer kids who have an iron deficient diet, that promotes the absorption of lead. So it's not just a lead problem, it's a socioeconomic problem on account of the poorer diet that these children have. So when I talk about the toxic culture that a materialistic society offers its uh, members, what am I referring to? Well, materialism is really uh, a system of, of belief or, or behavior which considers material things, and particularly the control and possession of material things, is more important than human values such as connection, love, or spiritual values such as recognizing the unity of everything. And that's the kind of culture we live in. Interestingly enough, the religious right, in their opposition to the very idea of climate change, or to the idea that the environment is important to look at, they will quote the Old Testament where man is given stewardship over the earth and all other creatures. But, but when they talk about stewardship, they mean control and dominance. There's another way to look at stewardship, which is caring and nurturing for, looking after. And in the materialistic sense, it's that control and ownership that we look at. And that means that the culture itself, quite apart from the physical toxins that we spew into the environment and the way in which we're altering the very air that we breathe and the very sun that beats down on us, that shines on us, we actually are affected also by the toxicity of human relationships or the lack of human relationships that this kind of a society that emphasizes material values uh, teaches us to pursue. And from that perspective, we have to understand that medicine is not simply uh, a science. It's much more than that. It's also an ideology. It's also an ideology. It's a way of looking at human beings. So when we look at human beings as individuals without understanding the importance of their social relationships and their emotional, psychological interactions with others, that's actually a manifestation of the individualistic perspective of the entrepreneur who says that only I matter and what I gain or what I control matters, and we're all in competition with one another. So you see that economic ideological perspective also showing up in its own particular way in the practice of medicine. Well, reality is totally different. Reality tells us that we can't be separated. And this begins already in pregnancy. So a study out of Johns Hopkins University in 2004, for example, showed that the reactivity to stress of the fetus is affected by the stress, depression, or anxiety of the mother. So when uh, you look at the heartbeat and the uh, movement of uh, infants in the womb whose mothers are stressed, depressed, or, or anxious, you see different patterns of activity. And that will have li lifetime effects. The, the studies reflect, this, this paper says, growing evidence that stress and depression can have early and lasting effects on the child's life, including increased behavior problems, including learning problems. And we also know that if you stress pregnant animals in the laboratory, their children will be more likely to use drugs as a way of soothe themselves once they've grown up. 
So this mind-body unity and this interaction of our environment and the individual begins already in the womb. And therefore, how we treat pregnant women, how we uh, provide an environment that's either supportive or, or possibly uh, stressful has a huge impact on the long-term development of their yet unborn um, offspring. And this, of course, happens uh, in doing infancy as well because that's a crucial period of brain development. So that the infants of healthy mothers have very different cortisol stress hormone levels than those of mothers with postpartum depression. And if you look at the electroencephalograms of infants with postpartum of mothers, I'm sorry, the electro, electroencephalograms of the infants of mothers who have postpartum depression, you can tell from the EEG of the child who's depressed and who isn't. So the child's electrical circuitry is already affected at six months of age by the mood of the mother. Now, in this society, 20% of women suffer postpartum depression, and another 20% have some symptoms of it. Now, that's not because of an individual problem with the part of the mother. Depression is not an individual issue. It reflects your relationship with the environment. And therefore, in this successful society, we're managing to depress 20% of women who give birth to babies. And that will have an effect on the child's brain hormone levels and neurotransmitter levels like dopamine and serotonin, and on the child's ability to respond to stress in a positive or in a highly charged and dysfunctional way. A report out of Harvard earlier this year talked about the impact of toxic stress on children. And these children who experienced toxic stress on the part on, on, because the environment was stressed, because their parents were highly stressed, or dysfunctional, or abusive, later on in life, they have a significantly increased risk of heart disease, obesity, diabetes mellitus, high blood pressure, and a whole list of other medical conditions. Not only that, how does an infant and a young child adjust to stress? Well, by certain coping mechanisms. If you're very stressed, but you're helpless in the face of the stress, and you can't escape it or to change it, one of the ways you'll respond is by tuning it out, by dissociating, by throwing your mind somewhere else so you don't have to suffer the discomfort and distress of the uh, pressures that the environment is placing upon you. But if you're doing that when you're one or two years old and your brain is developing, then tuning out becomes wired into your brain. And guess what? Eight years later, they're going to diagnose you with ADHD and give you medications. And if you're looking at the preponderance of all these childhood conditions that are just burgeoning in our society, autism, Asperger's, ADHD, oppositional defined disorder, a whole range of childhood disorders, what are we seeing? Not genetic problems, not individual problems, but the effects of a highly stressed environment on parents which are then passed on to their children despite the parents' love and despite the parents' best efforts. Other studies have shown similarly that early childhood adversity significantly increases the risk of uh, addiction, obesity, uh, autoimmune disease, mental health disorders, and so on. A simple fact such as parental divorce has been shown to increase the risk of strokes by a factor of two. It doubles them 50, 60, 70 years later. So, this is, and, I'm, and I'm thinking we're talking about divorces which have a lot of rancor and stress associated with them. So what happens early has a huge impact later on down the line. The good news, however, is that similarly, if you understand the biopsychosocial perspective here, we look at a study about stroke victims in their 60s and 70s. If they're surrounded by a loving, supportive community, their risk of, or sorry, their, their, their chances of recovery are far greater than those who suffer a stroke and are emotionally isolated, which again points to the importance of community and the importance of the environment from the psychological, social, and cultural perspective. Well, where does that leave us? It leaves us, first of all, looking at the economic issues. And what we know is that growing up in a low socioeconomic background can actually impair the working memory and uh, the size of different parts of the brain of the adult. So poverty in this country is far from simply an economic question. It's also a question of human development and what kind of consequences that'll have on people's behavior, capacity to respond to stress, and therefore to get ahead in a society in which getting ahead is the highest value. And if you don't get ahead, you're left behind. 
Similarly, children who are stressed early will have problems with impulse regulation later on. Impulse regulation means that their capacity to anticipate consequences and to respond calmly to the environment is impaired. And that means they're also going to be at a greater risk of addiction. Now, if you look at addictions, what are we looking at? We're actually looking at two factors. We're looking at, number one, the desperation to escape from the pain and distress that the child has experienced early on in life, which then become programmed into his personality and his heart and his brain. And how do you escape? Well, one way to escape is through addictive behaviors, whether that be drugs or the internet or sex or food or shopping or whatever else. And number two, since, as I've already mentioned, brain development early in life, early in life is affected by the environment, people who are traumatized early in life, especially those that are traumatized, their brain development is impaired and that their brain circuits and neurotransmitters and the chemicals in their brain are actually at a disadvantage. So when they do the drugs, they feel complete and whole and feel good for the first time in their lives. Their addiction is not a matter of choice. It's a matter of a coping mechanism that is a response to early stress. Now, if you look at what stress is, it's not just a psychological event. I've already alluded to it. It's a physical event. It sets off a cascade of hormones, particularly cortisol and adrenaline in your body, which in the short term, again, help you escape or to fight back, but in the long term, damage your heart, your, your nervous system, your intestines, and suppress your immune system, which then makes you more prone for all kinds of diseases, naturally. So when it comes to understanding something like cancer, we can't just understand it in terms of the individual. And as somebody uh, very astutely said a couple of years ago in a series on cancer that the New York Times um, published, that trying to understand cancer by studying the individual human cell is like trying to understand a traffic jam by looking inside the internal combustion engine. <laughs> you, really have to look at, you really have to look at the whole picture, and that whole picture involves the lifelong environment in which we live. And from that same perspective again, when we look at something like the obesity epidemic, which has 30% of kids in the United States overweight now, significantly overweight, it's not a food problem. Well, it is a food problem, the junk foods and all that. But it's mostly a stress problem, because what people do is they soothe their stresses, like any addiction, they soothe their stresses with their addictive behaviors. And those junk foods work in the short term because they release feel-good hormones in the brain. So if you want to look at children and prevent obesity, it's not enough to tell them not to eat junk foods or to get more exercise. You have to say, what's lacking in their lives that they're so stressed, that they have to suit themselves in that particular way? And what's, what's lacking in their lives, of course, are human relationships that are nurturing and supportive. Again, not because the parents are not trying to do their best, but because the parents are trying to do their best under impossible circumstances. If you look at what actually triggers stress, the significant factors that trigger stress are uncertainty, lack of information, and loss of control. If you look at rats, and you hook two pairs of rats together, or two rats together, yoke them together, and you attach an electrode to their tails, and you shock them with electricity, they will have physiological stress. But if one rat has a paw open that can shut off the lever that delivers that stress, that electrical shock, even though both rats get the same electrical jolt for the same period of time, the rat with the paw free will have less stress hormones in their body because they have some control. Now, what happens in a culture where the economy is going on a tube, where decisions are made far away by people who don't even know you and you don't know who they are, and your life is very much affected by these large forces over which you have increasingly a sense that you have no control or even influence over, well, that means a lot of people are going to be stressed, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of people are going to be stressed. And that stress then will lead to addictive behaviors, that stress then will lead to uh, parents passing that stress on to their children. In the 19th century, Karl Marx talked about alienation, which is a separation, uh, being a stranger to something. And uh, you're an alien to something. And Marx said there were four, alien four alienations in this culture. 
One is alienated from nature. Well, at a conference dedicated to looking at the physical and the natural environment, we don't, I don't have to say much to you to show how alienated we are from nature when we're destroying nature itself. The second alienation is from other people. And that means we have less contact, we have less intimacy, we have less trust. We have less of a sense of relationship. And that, of course, as I've shown you, leads to increased propensity to illness, physical and mental. We are alienated from our work. A lot of people no longer do work that has any meaning to them. And that means that, and since human beings are productive creatures, we really are created in the image of God. We're meant to create. When we do work that's not creative, that doesn't reflect who we are, that imposes depression, anxiety, um, a sense of meaninglessness. And when we have a sense of meaninglessness, we'll want to substitute that sense of meaninglessness or that sense of meaning that we've lost by all kinds of other activities, and then we get all hung up on how we look or how people feel about us, what we can obtain, what we can possess, what successes we can achieve. In other words, all the false uh, substitutes which cannot possibly compensate us for the lack of genuine meaning. And of course, what this society does, it sells us a lot of products that substitute for that loss of meaning. In fact, much of the economy is based on a loss of meaning in our culture. And finally, and most importantly, we become alienated. <laughs> finally, and most importantly, we become alienated from ourselves. Well, let me ask you a question here, and I'm going to ask for a show of hands. How many of you had the following experience? That you had a powerful gut feeling about something, you didn't pay attention to it, and you were sorry afterwards? Please put your hand up if you have. Okay? I think the eyes have it. If I asked you the obverse question, as to how many people have had a powerful gut feeling, you ignored it, and you were glad about it afterwards, how many would not put your hand up? Well, I'm not sure. I'm seeing very few hands here. Well, that means to say, now, you know what you're telling me? You're telling me that at some point in your childhood, you got separated from yourself. Because no infant is born without gut feelings. Their to infants are totally connected to their gut feelings. Have you ever met a two-day-old who didn't know how to express their gut feelings? <laughs> and that means that in this culture, something very powerful happens to alienate you from your true self because the world couldn't stand who you really were and your parents were too stressed themselves to honor and recognize who you really were, just as a parent, I did that to my kids without meaning to. And then we become alienated from ourselves, we shut down our gut feelings, and our gut feelings are not luxuries, you know. They tell us what is right and what is wrong. They tell us what is dangerous and what is friendly. They tell us what is safe and what is dangerous. And they tell us what is true and what is false. So when we're alienated from our gut feelings, we have no longer have a sense of reality, no longer a sense of truth. Well, the good news is, the good news is that human beings can regain their sense of connection to themselves, just as we can re regain our sense of connection to our nature. I will make just one final point here about the economics of it. A Harvard study this year, oh, sorry, a Harvard study uh, three years ago showed that the lack of medical insurance in this country leads to 45,000 deaths annually. This is not an ideological question about health care. And the most recently, President Bush said, well, there's no problem. Everybody can show up in the emergency ward. Sure you can. Once you've had a stroke because you didn't get treated for your high blood pressure, which you, which you got because you were so stressed, you can go to the emergency ward and you get treated for your stroke. But the lack of health care that's available to people, which is very much a social economic question, it itself is a significant factor. Well, the good news is that we can regain, regain a connection to ourselves. And um, empathy, which is a genuine human quality, is in us. We're actually wired for empathy. Even rats are wired for empathy. When you stress rats, rats in the laboratory by shocking their feet with electricity, they're more stressed watching other rats being shocked than when they're shocked themselves. Their stress hormone levels are higher. That's our nature as human beings. So contrary to the myth in our culture 
that were separated, individual, uh, aggressive, competitive creatures, were actually wired for empathy, wired for connection, wired for love, wired for um, compassion. So really, to move forward, all we have to do... All we have to do, not an easy task, but it's certainly available to us, is to get back to our true nature. Thank you.